So the, we're continuing on this um, thread. And what I realized is I spent five minutes just reading everyone's bios. So I'm going to do shorter versions of the bios to get you to learn more about people. Um, but I'm really happy to introduce Marco Bay, who is also on the board of directors of After the Fire and has kept this going. And Marco is the executive director and founder of the Loma Kotze Restoration Project. He oversees all of the organization's efforts. And his central focus is on program and organizational development, project procurement, planning, and operations. And we're going to learn more about what Loma Kotze does. And with him is the amazing Belinda. Brown, who provides leadership for Loma Kotze's Tribal Partnerships Program and chairs the Intertribal Ecosystem Restoration Partnership. She works closely with Loma Kotze's ED and staff leadership to serve tribal communities in their efforts to restore forests and watersheds on tribal trust and ancestral lands. She's also um, co-leading the development of the Indian Youth Service Corps designation and federal agreement process for Loma Kotze. So I'm really happy to share the stage with Marco and Belinda, and I um, asked to have a little bit of time because I have been thinking about this a lot. As I mentioned, we have a 3,200 acre property I used to steward. The best scientists that we could bring to bear on the problem said, what's, what's the thing that we need to restore in terms of ecosystem function? And the main cause of decline of the ecosystem health of our area was the interruption of indigenous stewardship. This was before we had fires and before fire even became part of the conversation. And so I've really been thinking about the fact that, you know, you love and want to protect what you grew up with. And if you grew up in this region, you grew up with these big forests covered with Douglas fir, and you think, oh, we have to protect these forests. But I learned from indigenous leadership that those forests were very out of balance. And it was hard for me to see, but when I had local indigenous leaders leading us through, they'd say, no, this doesn't look good. This, this looks kind of congested. And so I just wanted to highlight um, a study that was recently done. I don't know many studies like this that took a snapshot of what this landscape looked like in 1850. Um, and I'm not going to be able to walk you through all of it, but if you look at these pie charts, the yellow is shrubs and grasslands. And what has happened is that this green slice, which are the Douglas fir, have been expanding and invading those areas. So it's a native invasive plant that spreads without indigenous fire on the landscape. Um, and I just think it's a big deal, especially if you are coming from the environmental perspective, to wrap your head around how different the landscape looked under indigenous stewardship and that we need to be managing to get back to that. So um, Arthur Dawson is the lead author of this study. And um, it's a CAL FIRE report that's very long, but you can access it here. And this is just an example of a tour that he took with an indigenous leader showing that where these Douglas fir are coming up, the um, historic manzanita and other native plants are dead, lying dead under those in invasions. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Marco. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Jennifer, and after the fire, for organizing such a great gathering, year three, and um, all the first responders in the room, and everybody who's working for resilient landscapes, resilient communities. Um, so Belinda Brown and I, we're gonna, we're gonna pass the mic back and forth. We're gonna share some conversation. Um, this slide here, we had a fire in 2009 called the Siskiyou Fire in Southern Oregon, just over the border of Siskiyou County into Jackson County, Oregon. And that fire began in September. Uh, it was a weed eater event, and it burned um, across the slopes of private lands. We lost about five homes, relatively small. They put a lot of air resources on it, but then the fire went into uh, the edge of our municipal watershed in Ashland, Oregon. And um, it was an eye-opener. 200-foot flame lamps, a wind-driven event, kind of an anomaly day in September, like we're seeing more of. It was just kind of a reminder of the direction things have moved over the last 15, 10, into 20 years. And that uh, watch duty was a clip just from the middle of July, just a couple months ago, at how much fire we have across, uh, across the West. And these mega fires like we've never seen, we're all aware of this. That's why we're gathered here today. So um, in thinking about uh, wildfire severity, we live in a fire adapted ecosystem. Um, you know, influenced by lightning, and as Lisa mentioned, uh, Aboriginal 
carefully applied, stewarded, and engineered fire by tribal people that continues to be uh, engineered and put on the ground by tribal people. And you can see these um, quantitative risk assessments and fire ha hazard severity maps. We live in, a, in the era of megafires that's gonna continue. How do we build that community model? We're hearing about different models and opportunities and develop that fire steward um, community, stewards of fire, and change our thinking and relationship with fire. So this is the quantitative risk assessment in Oregon. It um, maps out risk to communities, departure of ecosystems, like uh, Lisa mentioned, and that highly departed landscape from previous land management practices that have set the stage with tree plantations and lots of logging slash and lots of um, non-active management on the ground has created the, the situation we're in. So this gives us a roadmap. What can we do and how do we address that? And then next slide. You know, the FEMA uh, fire risk map, just look at the West. I mean, we're gonna be living with a lot of fire. They're only gonna get larger. So what's the solution next? So solutions are creating those resilient landscapes. We've heard about mitigation. We've heard about community wildfire uh, protection around home sites, home site defensible space. There's different values for different communities, but we're thinking on a landscape scale. Like in the Rogue River Siskiyou, where we do a lot of our work, Lomakatsi Restoration Project, our organization. We have a 4.6 million acre watershed that is in need of restoration. At least a million, 1.2 million acres needs active management, highly departed forests. And we're seeing that landscape continue to burn. Oregon, 1.5 million acres, record breaking fires like we've never seen this year. And we're not even through fire season yet. We have fire crews out on the ground right now up in the North Umpqua in Oregon, fire crews in the Rogue River Siskiyou. In addition to being fire stewards, we know we have to suppress fire in the right places, in the right time to protect communities. But ultimately, we wanna set the stage for mild fire, good burning on the ground, to be stewards of that ecosystem, to protect more than just communities, but water, ecosystem services, and all the values and benefits uh, that we care about on the ground. So for tribal perspective, and I, I haven't seen these slides, so uh, forgive me, but I always wanna be able to sure, make sure that we get a pulse on the room and uh, just honoring the people that were here before us, the ancestral people that were on this land right here, the Wapo, the Coast Miwok, the Pomo, and the fact that they put fire on the land, that fire is medicine for the land, and there's good fire. So 150 years of mismanagement or non-management or our people not being on this land, and these tribes were terminated in 1959. So that was one year before I was born. So this is recent. So this is recent trauma-informed care, even for our people. So bringing it back to that indigenous-centered knowledge, that core of where we come from as people, uh, these people here were renowned for their basket making, and they needed fire on the ground. Women put fire on the ground for their baskets, for their food, for everything that we needed. This land was our, our home. The landscape was our pharmacy, our grocery store, our church, our Home Depot. Very well taken care of landscape. So many times we're debunking the John Muir myth of this wasn't just a wilderness landscape. This was a very well-tended place, and we're place-based people, and we're all place-based people who need to take care of the land and to take care of each other during times of crisis and just every day. So we're all indigenous to some place. Some place you have a home, you have a heartland on this earth and you all come from a singing and a drumming and a dancing society. We're Aboriginal, this is our heartland. My heartland's a little to the north in Modoc, Shasta, Lassen, and Siskiyou counties, the Pitt River tribe, the Ajumawi Atsage Nation, and I'm part of the Kosalekta Band, the people from the Juniper Hillside. We also put fire on the land. I grew up putting fire on the ground with my grandfather, with my father, we had a ranch in Modoc County. We had a ranch in Chico, California. We raised cattle, but we burned every fall, every summer. So we had actually a ranch down in Cohasset Road. Anybody hear of that place recently? 
Yeah. So we uh, grazed our cattle up in Butte Creek. So all the areas that have been burning up recently, when we took our cattle off in the fall, we burned it. So every farmer, rancher, Native American, Aboriginal person used fire as a land management tool. And now we continue as Loma Kotze, a nonprofit for 30 years. Everything that we do is really setting the stage for good fire to come back on the land. We do ecological thinning. Um, you're gonna see a slide here shortly that we're active management work. So the, the separation from the people and the land is what is off right now. We are supposed to be on this land. We're supposed to be working, surviving, uh, sustaining ourselves from this land and this earth. And we're supposed to be taking care of Mother Earth. As Margot Robbins, Elizabeth Azuz from Culture of Fire Management Council were here a few years ago, uh, said this is medicine, fire's medicine for the land and we need more of it. So we shouldn't be afraid of it. And I know for our, uh, our partners here, our fellow people from Hawaii, the indigenous people, Aboriginal people from Hawaii, and Lahaina was the only place in Hawaii I ever visited, so that really hurt me. I was like, oh, it's the only beautiful place I've been in Hawaii. That language that Jennifer was talking about yesterday, that language of love, those core values that really keep you as a people is what we need to share now. So our language of love is our Aboriginal knowledge, is our, the indigenous traditional ecological knowledge of the people that were here. And no matter whose name is on the land base right now, our people are still commissioned to take care of this land. And so we have to have the awkward conversations with all of you, with the agencies, with our partners, with our nonprofit partners, with homeowners, everybody of how we need to impart our Aboriginal knowledge back into this ecosystem. So if you could just go back to the next, the previous slide. Um, reverse. So. so what embodies that is this image of the bootleg fire. The area that um, our tribal crews and the Klamath tribes in partnership with Lomakatsi and the Nature Conservancy and the Forest Service, this is the former Klamath tribes reservation, now National Forest. We went in, we ecologically thinned, we marked this stand, we carefully applied fire, we removed 40 million board feet in an ecological way of smaller diameter trees. And when the bootleg fire came, that's the Green Island that survived. Belinda and I actually walked through there during the fire and it was burning at six foot flame lamps, beautiful right through the understory. So when we think of the landscape and the towns and communities around these places, we think about forest resiliency. Next. And we, we looked at this slide, so we're changing the paradigm. Eco stewards, fire lighters, land tenders, firefighters. There's time and a place that we need to get, get after those fires. We had a fire right near our office last week. Helicopter resources, they got that fire out really quick. Our friends and relatives from the fire service. Next. So community of Jacksonville, similar to, kind of reminds me of Sonoma a little bit, you know, affluent, there's some money there. And um, this is our team of tribal crew members putting fire on the ground, protecting the community, thinking about resilient landscapes, working, working under the National Cohesive Wildfire Strategy. If you haven't looked that up, that's a key component. The missing element to that of resilient communities, protecting the landscape, emergency response, was what Belinda just spoke about, incorporating indigenous traditional ecological knowledge into the mix. But Jacksonville gets a lot of resources. We apply for grants, we build this community resilience movement, state, private, and tribal forestry funds from the Forest Service are paying for this work. Next slide. And then we have the community of Fort Bidwell, Fort Bidwell Indian Reservation, the Northern Paiute Gedutigid Band, where Belinda and I live in that community. You could see surrounded by Forest Service, the reservation's 3,500 acres, and that's the fire that came over the hill, the Barnes fire, two summers ago. And then the resources, to try to access federal resources for these tribal lands is a lot more challenging. We're, we're doing that day in and day out. Next. And you could see bringing state money from Oregon, Oregon Conservation Corps and tribal crews to protect tribal housing, to uh, thin the brush and vegetation around. It takes innovation, philanthropy, creative thinking, corporate investment, Hewlett Packard, uh, HP, donated money for this program. Next. 
And that resiliency is not just for, um, once again, for homes, but for the landscape, restoring sage step habitat for wildlife. That's a before and after. Next. And I'll turn this over to Belinda. This is mild fire uh, paradiridia. So again, uh, our people burn for the roots, for the plants. 85% of our food was gathered. So it was very important that we get fire out there. Again, it's going to come back to you. It's going to come back to how prepared you are. How prepared can we all be to face these events? And when we go out there, gather roots together, do gatherings like this, have summits like this, come together as a community, that's what it's going to take. And so we all have built these walls around us in this uh, colonial uh, world that we live in, and we all live in these separate nuclear little families, and that wasn't the way that we were supposed to live. And if I could uh, ask you to settle down in that part of you that is indigenous, that is tribal, that is community, that's the heart that we need to have to face and to walk through these crises that come. So we're all having to get out of our comfort zone. We're all having to come into places that we haven't been before, maybe make friends with people that we wouldn't necessarily make friends with, agencies working together, communities working together. We have a similar problem. We have a similar crisis, and it's going to take the human heart. And what Jennifer talked about yesterday when I first showed up, that language of love that we have been separated from as a people, and we need to come back together and we need to center ourselves in that indigenous traditional ecological knowledge so that we can make good choices, that we are prepared for these crises, and that we are building our community strong where we live. We know our neighbor, we know their name, and that we have that community when we need that community. And the word unity is in community, and I've always stress that throughout everything that I share. Let's have that unity of the people here in this room. There's a lot of love in this room. There's a lot of knowledge in this room. There's a lot of understanding in this room. And there's some wisdom in this room. And one of our elders have told us that the hardest and bumpiest road to travel is from your head to your heart. So from knowledge to understanding. And so drop down into what you understand and know. And, and know your neighbor. Know your community, because that is the most important thing when these crises hit. All right. So let's address the question about federal access. I'm not sure what your question was, so. Funds. Programs. Oh, accessing federal funds? Uh, hi, Jennifer Gray Thompson, um, After the Fire. And my question is, you, your organization is particularly adept at working with the federal government, fishing game, and getting contracts. You've gotten them to see the value of the work that you're doing. That is very hard for a lot of places. And then how to implement it, too. And you're training your workforce. These are all lessons, too, that, that Maui has a lot of it in place, but like just to bring it all the way home. That's what I'd love for you to talk about. You're very successful. Thank you. And we, we touched on it a little bit, but... Um, we, we showed Fort Bidwell, we showed Jacksonville, two different communities. We were actually on phone calls today with the National Office of Department of Interior, accessing Bureau of Indian Affairs funds, funds from the Forest Service, BLM, state dollars. The key for our, um, our success has been understanding the instruments. So we're shovel ready. We have different authorities like stewardship authority under the Farm Bill. We have different agreement mechanisms like 93638, through Bureau of Indian Affairs, interagency agreements that non-government organizations can utilize, but a big part of our success is leaning on tribal sovereignty, our tribal partners that we have memorandums of understanding with, and they loan us their sovereignty through tribal resolutions and Belinda's leadership to access those dollars, to put those into agreements, so we're not having to chase grant money all the time, and we'd still do chase grant money all the time, but those agreements are 10-year agreements, and then when appropriations come down, we can direct those dollars into those agreements and we could have shovel-ready projects, get projects NEPA-ready, National Environmental Policy Act, and ready to put workforces on the ground. Indian Youth Service Corps is another authority. So knowing those different authorities and then integrating uh, philanthropic dollars, we heard that during the last presentation, and opportunities for corporate investment because we have to leverage non-federal funds but mapping out what are those different authorities, what are those agreements, and uh, Jennifer, you do a great job working the Hill back in DC, having those relationships with our uh, federal uh, partners back in Washington, 
and then our regional agencies and continuing to beat, beat the drum to get their attention. You know, along with those agreements, private philanthropy and corporate philanthropy is really important too because all those agreements require 20 to 25% match. So we have master stewardship agreements across Oregon um, and California. We, our Indian Youth Service a core agreement is with multi-regional with Washington, Oregon, and California, and it requires a 25% match. So one of the projects that we did started out with a FEMA grant of $500,000. It was a West Bear project in the footprint of the Almeida fire in 2020 that took out 2,500 homes and three of our staff lost their home during that fire. A $500,000 project has turned into a $14 million project, cobbling together all agency, private philanthropy, dollars to make this project work and to protect homes and create uh, resiliency in that community. So again, um, everybody out there, you're pitching in, it's what makes it work. I have one last question there, which with this big infusion now of climate investment money, are you seeing a connection with the new money that's come out of the Biden administration through the Inflation Reduction Act and IJJA? How, how is that working for you? Are you able to access climate funds as part of this? How it's working for us is called a seven seven day work week. Um, we we we've been very very shovel ready for those climate adaptation funds coming through bipartisan inf infrastructure law and um, inflation reduction act dollars. But that's the key to having those agreements and tracing back uh, where are those climate resiliency funds through different agencies and being able to see how to train and navigate those dollars. So um, it's it's been a, a huge benefit for the communities we serve. We have the Climate Corps that we're a member of through Indian Youth Service Corps, and um, more co-investment from our, from our partners, and even at the state level, accessing uh, state dollars through different climate investments is a part of the mix of getting this work done, creating hundreds of jobs, creating resilient landscapes. Yeah, just to emphasize that too, we're implementing partner with the American Climate Corps, along with being a member of the core network and working towards accreditation. And Belinda, I think the last thing I just would like to highlight is your toolkit that you have for communities that want to work with indigenous communities. Could you talk a little bit about that and how people could access resources from Lomakatsi? Yeah, for Lomakatsi, we have the Intertribal Ecosystem Restoration Partnership. We also have the collaborative framework model that's a best practice of communities coming together and working together. So we can make that available to everybody, our collaborative framework model and also our Intertribal Ecosystem Restoration Partnership model. So we will make that available. Thank you guys, thank you for your incredible work. Thank you. I know you're gonna have follow-up questions. <laughs>